God and Other Delicacies has a weekly newsletter. If you'd like to subscribe, email me at godsdelicateshow at gmail.com and I'll put you on the list. Hello, everyone. Welcome to God and Other Delicacies. I'm Nicholas D'Augusto. Thanks for being here. I get to talk about God again today. I'm telling you, I feel like I'm getting away with something. I love it. Let's get into it. Today, I have the privilege of welcoming Matt Hayes to the show. Matt is an actor, writer, and director. He has appeared on shows like Jane the Virgin and Boundaries, but most notably, he's created a lovely and very personal short film called Cognitive that is presently running the festival circuit. He also has the unique distinction of being the first guest on my show that I did not know previously. Welcome to the show, Matt. <laughs> Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, as you obviously know, but the listeners do not, uh, Jessalyn Gilsig, who was on the show, um, I think episode four, yeah. was, uh, it, it, we had a wonderful conversation, yes. and uh, I, love, I love her show, as I've loved all of them, and, and almost Immediately after we got out of the show, as you just confirmed for me, she reached out to you, but she told me, she's like, I just did a short film with this guy, Aww. made this really beautiful thing. It's talking about this really fascinating backstory, and I would love to introduce you. And so she sent an email to both you and I, yep. and uh, thankfully you responded really positively, and you have a really, really fascinating story, which of course we're going to get into, sure. but why don't you talk about what the movie's doing right now? So where yeah. is it at out in the world, and where's it going? And yeah. Um, so this movie's been a crazy whirlwind of an experience. It all started last uh, September uh, with Jessalyn. We were at the studio where right, we do uh, speed rolls, where we do self tapes and coachings and stuff. And uh, we were testing out a new lens, and she wanted to. She's like, "Just go up and like say something on camera. We're just going to record." I was like, "Cool." So I went up and I just spit out a monologue that I've kind of been working on in my head. And it was about four minutes, and I finished. And she said, "Oh my god, like you have to script that out." And I was like, "Okay, whatever." So I came back a couple of days later was like with a 30-page script, and I was like, I think I have something. Um, and she's like, oh, my God. So I started you know, doing, um, cutting the fat out and stuff, and uh, I drunkenly launched an Indiegogo campaign about three weeks <laughs> I, later I, I love uh, at like How 2 a.m. on a Friday coming back from the bar, and uh, which is breaking all the rules for crowdsourcing, right? Sure. Um, never on a Friday, never on a, you know. You also went off on a tangent where, like, by the way, this fucking guy walked up <laughs> to me and said, I was like, screw you. By yeah, the way, right? that's not what this Indiegogo is about. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And but lo and behold, we, in three weeks we raised over twenty two thousand dollars. Wow, uh, that's I was incredible, Lord! And but it was wow. a sign that people really wanted to hear the message of what the film was representing, which is um, the overall message being you're okay, which is something we all need to hear as humans. It's not uh, mine was kind of centered around the LGBTQ element, but it's it's not specifically for that um, for that demographic. It's for everyone. We all want to be validated in some form or another. Um, so we started getting the word out, and uh, people started just throwing in set locations and, you know, uh, um, calling in crew and everything. And by the, you know, end of, I think, October, we were, like, set to film in a week. It was crazy. Wow. Um, that's, that's what it, congratulations. Yeah, that's amazing. It was insane. Um, and, I, you know, if you had told me eight weeks before that that, you know, you're going to make a short film, I'd be like, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, and then it happened. And yeah, wow. And it's just been crazy. And now we're in, we, we're in seven festivals officially. Um, we are uh, in the Compassion Film Festival in Colorado, our LA premiere is going to be the Love International Festival in Santa Monica. Uh, we are in North Carolina Gay and Lesbian. We're in uh, Las Vegas International. We are in, um, I just got into Chicago's Reeling Festival, which is a really big one for us. Um, cool. Yeah, it's just been and so, crazy. And where can people find, do you have a website up for it? Yeah, so you can either go to facebook.com slash cognitive film, uh, or all my social media has got everything about it as well, because I want it to be pretty integrated, um, which is just Hayes on it, H-A-Y-E-S on it. So, yeah. Right on. But that, as, as we announce, you'll just see all the information. And I'm going to try to go to a lot of the festivals, um, just because a lot of my crowdsourcing came from all over the country and yeah. world, really. So, Well, you know, uh, people will get a chance, very, you know, a very intimate look into what this film is about by yeah. you being on this show. This show lines yeah. up pretty directly yeah. with what your movie is <laughs> about. It does. And so, um, it's of course, why Jessalyn... Um, put us together. Yeah. I'm really excited. Uh, you know, if you if you like what you hear today, which hopefully you will, uh, then you'll enjoy seeing the movie. It's a really beautiful little short film, and um, 
And as we said, it's very personal, very intimate. And Jesselyn's in it. And Jesselyn's yeah. in it. And also, I didn't know that Jesselyn was like, you were together working, yeah. and she helped, was part of the inspiration, part of yeah. the catalyst for you. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, so much that I gave uh, her company Speed Reels, I gave them co-production front-end credit, because I just oh, wow. was so humbled by how much she inspired and encouraged and um, kept me lifted during the process. Wow. So, yeah. That's wonderful. Well, I mean, I, I also have this same affection you probably have even a deeper affection for for how cool jessalyn is so that's that's really great all right man listen this is the really the hot heavy question is what you have for breakfast that's the (laughs) thing that always trips people up on this show well it was a doozy so i i'm moving i cannot wait to hear it (laughs) and i knew this question was coming too and i was and i like jessalyn was like i want to have something really good to talk about you know i love that people are trying to like (laughs) (laughs) really (laughs) went to the ivy they're like making yeah yeah, exactly five course breakfast um no but so i'm moving this weekend so i've tried to not restock as i am you know i'm in prep and so i had uh uh, my, I have a smoothie every morning to get all my nutrients in from the get-go, right? Um, you healthy yeah. you healthy gym rat, I'm <laughs> yeah. sure. I see you. Yeah. You work out. Well, so this morning I had, uh, it was almond milk, kale, leftover oats, and but I didn't have any fruits. So we're already like at a, a negative as it <laughs> refers to taste. Um, but a couple weeks ago I was sick and I had leftover Pedialyte. And so I put strawberry banana Pedialyte in my smoothie. How, how did that it go? It was terrible. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah. so it awful. Like, that's one of those unfortunate things that has almost no taste but can ruin everything else terrible. around it. No, but I drank it all because I, I wanted something in my stomach because I had, yeah, had yeah, coffee yeah. by that point. And I was like, if I go on this show, empty stomach, caffeinated, it's not going to be a good I thing. I feel that way too. I um, feel that way too. Plus you get in the middle of this deep conversation so early in the morning and you are just, if you don't have any food in your stomach, you really do yeah. start drifting. Yeah. <laughs> so I chugged it. <laughs> and so and about. you didn't retch. It no. didn't come back up. It was. Thankfully. It actually was really sweet. It was because that Pedialyte's so syrupy. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it covered up the. Ca- I don't know that I would ever recommend it or do it again. But uh, you know, I feel full right now. Yeah. Um, oh, well, very good. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I recently had to try Pedialyte sometime in the last year because I have a little boy oh. and um, he was sick at some point and. Uh, Whatever, you know, you just try these things mm-hmm. because whatever. I, I had, Whenever I get, if I get sick or something, I end up just grabbing a vitamin water. That's like my equivalent. It's yes. not quite the same, but that's what I do. And um, and it was terrible. It's just yeah. absolutely horrible. But I, I guess it's, there's something about sugar being sugar, even if it doesn't taste good, that children will respond to. Mm-hmm. Just as long as they can taste, mm-hmm. as long as the, fi- the taste buds fire sugar to their brain, yeah. then they don't care what it tastes I'm like. I'm kind of in that place now. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Okay, man. Well, so this is what gets us into the meat of the show and what you, know, what you clearly have been um, reflecting on, not only your whole life, but what you're doing with this movie yeah. is how and when were you introduced to the idea of God in your life? Uh, well, like any good Southern boy, uh, it was real young. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I grew up Southern Baptist, so and I where was, I know I know the state, but tell please Dec- tell us where uh, you're Decatur, at? Alabama, which Decatur. is about an hour nor- uh, north of Birmingham, so it's really close to the Tennessee state line. Okay. Um, great little town on the river. I mean, it's, you know, beautiful. Um, you know, lots of industry, and you know, people are nice and whatever. Tons of church. I think at one time it held the record. For the largest number of churches per capita. Wow. Um, I, I mean, people, it doesn't surprise me, but it's always interesting to hear that stuff. Churches share parking lots there because there's just no space. Wow. Because um, there's churches everywhere. Wow. Every, That's every denomination. Really, churches share. I'm trying to yeah. really interpret what that means. Yeah. There's so many churches that they and they're so well attended. Uh-huh. Yeah. That well, that's I tell people, and probably the same where you're from. When you meet someone, you know, in this small town, it's like, oh, what's your name? Where do you go to church? Because that instantly gives a, an uh, an idea of, to their socioeconomic status, what school um, school district they're in, um, you know, what what kind of job they probably have, what part of town they live in. Uh, it, it informs everything about the person. What church do you go to? And and if you don't go to church. Well, that just informs, I mean, <laughs> to a detriment, but Big it time. really does. It, it says where you go to school, you know, what kind of income you have. Uh, yeah. it's. Can you help me? This is right out of the gate. I want to, um, you're going to help me understand something about what Southern Baptist is. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I uh, have been thinking about, certainly I know a lot about Catholicism. Mm-hmm. I know a little bit about some other things that are kind of near Catholicism. What makes Southern Baptist, uh, what, what makes it distinctly different than... Like Catholicism, which has sort of like the historical standard of mm-hmm. being like the one making the laws for many, many years. What 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 is the history of Southern Baptist? How much can you speak to that? Um, I don't know the history in terms of you know where the denomination came from and stuff. Uh, I have this 
this phrase that I use called love-based hate, which I think is uh, wow. a, a lot of what evangelicals are uh, being perceived as right now. Is evangelical and Southern Baptist synonymous? Oh, yeah. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, because I, I get confused sometimes. I know that they they tend to be very political, at least, yeah. and I've done some research uh listening to some cool podcasts or yeah. whatever that are helping me understand, okay, the evangelical movement is not as old as people think. It's maybe 40 mm-hmm. or 50 years old. It was something that kind of yeah. happened in the 60s, 70s as a response. And it really, it was, evangelicalism was really tied into a, a political movement as well uh, for leadership. Uh, you know, late 60s, 70s is when it really started picking up. But I do think the Southern Baptist uh, is the largest organized faction of the evangelical movement. Is the evangelical movement the larger name and Southern Baptist is yes, underneath I would, that? Yes, I would so say that's so accurate. So there's Southern Baptist and there's some other kind yeah, of there's, Baptist? Yeah, you know, or... probably some form of, uh, you know, there's uh, the, the PCA Presbyterians, there's, uh, there's a... Presbyterians Luther- are also evangelicals. Well, there's so there's two different Presbyterian, uh, two mainline Presbyterian groups. There's USA and PCA. PCA, um, and I could be not 100% accurate on this, but they, they align themselves... I'm willing themselves. to trust anything you say. <laughs> that's so scary. <laughs> Um, but they align themselves with John Calvin. So there's the, th- the five points of Calvinism, which is predestination, um, <clears throat> the, the, uh, innate uh, sinfulness, which means everyone is born basically evil right. um, and has to be saved by a, a savior. This is, I'm yeah. super interested in this. Please continue. What is what's the third thing? Uh, I forget. I should have studied the five points. Great. That's um, okay. No, I'm sorry, but this this is the fact that yeah. you. I don't think I knew that there was Calvin, the five predestination points of is the big one. So basically, predestination. It, yes. yes. So it basically, suggests you're born that, to. Yeah. Go ahead. That you don't have a choice in your salvation, that, right. that it is preordained by God. Wow. Um, so when you're born, wow. you know, if you become saved, which is the term that they use to, 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 to signify that point in your life where you are, you know, then get to go to heaven, um, that you don't have a choice into, into whether that happens. It's just going to happen because God has ordained you to come to a point in your life where you decide to get saved. So do they do, is he constantly walking the line of like, yes, you still have free will and you make the choices, but God knows what choice you're going to make. Is that the deal? And my qualm with that is if that's the case, then does God not ordain poor choices and evil and sin? And I can't live, I mean, and I actually, absolutely under that, you have to assume so. I, I aligned with, with, uh, Calvinism in high school. Um, and I, and my poor dad, I mean, my parents were so, they had to deal with so much raising me because I just was always outside the box um, and gay. Uh, but they, they dealt with a lot. And well, one of I them... will get more to that. <laughs> the, the parents part of this is a thing I love to yeah. hear about where they came from and how that influ- That's obviously so much about how we feel about religion. It influences us. But please go down this road a little bit about, if, do you have anything more you want to say about the Calvinism thing or do you want to start talking about your parents? Uh, no, just that, I mean, I remember having conversations with my dad and just trying to convince him that, that we were predestined um, and, you know, he was not of that mindset, but he, you know, for some reason humored me um, and allowed me to explore that. But I, I mean, in high school, I always was, was searching for different types of, of religion and, and wanting to know more and more. I, I ordered the Book of Mormon at like 16 years old off one of those TV commercials. Wow. Um, you started with some real extreme ones. Oh my gosh, I know. Yeah. Um, not you know, because I, mean, I wanted to become Mormon, but just because I wanted right. to know what made them you know, wrong as it relates to, to true Christianity. Right, know? exactly, exactly, right. That's such right. a little you know, I'm sure, would you have felt the same way about Catholics? Would you have felt oh. that Catholics are way too liberal or something like that? Oh, not that? liberal. No, well, they were just wrong. They're just straight up <laughs> yeah. wrong. I love that about um, Christianity, that each denomination is... Oh, my gosh. And, and the only thing that you can get together on is that you hate atheists more than you hate each other. But, oh, yeah. But, but I love the fact that... Um, look, I don't love it. Catholics I, I, I just relish this conversation is that how difficult it is for people... Um, to reconcile the differences uh-huh. of denomination, but yeah, um, we had one Catholic church in my hometown, and the caters about maybe sixty thousand people, um, and there was one Catholic church. No one let them share parking lots. No, oh no, <laughs> no, they had their own like acreage. Yeah, um, but they they were that's where the Yankees went. That's where the Northerners went to church was the Catholic church. Okay. Yeah, the transplants. Uh huh. And and with Southern Baptists too. I remember this one time we had um, Church of Christ friends, and Church of Christ were a bit more extreme than Southern Baptists. Okay, um, can and you help views. me understand? Yes. That? Um, my parents are some of the. You know, I use the term godly. Um, it's a pretty large word, I feel like. But my parents are very godly people. They're very God driven, um, God fearing, and they're just they're wonderful people. But they um, wanted to to bless the dinner one time before you know to say grace with these Church of Christ friends, and the Church of Christ friends would not let them say. The blessing for dinner because it wouldn't count basically. Wow. And I will never forget that. 
Wow. Yeah. So you've had you're having guests over to your home. Mm-hmm. I think we they, my parents were in their home. Oh, I to see. To be to be fair, but still, like, still, uh, they did not think the, that the, your guests are offering. Yeah. You know, to say something beautiful. Correct. Uh, to, to give uh, thanks sh- for food. Yeah, and to give thanks, I'm sure, to their hosts. Yes. And the hosts were like, no, no, no. The true God won't hear your prayer. That's wow. basically what they were saying. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, As if we don't have such bigger yes. issues in life. <laughs> then, I mean, it just, it's so... Uh, yeah. Okay, so there's, I mean, already, yeah. I have so many areas <laughs> I want to go here. But let's start, at, let's start at the beginning, because I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, because we have a lot of time. Um... You're, you you start by saying that your parents were actually not. It doesn't sound to me that your parents were as conservative or um, as ex, maybe I don't want to put words in your mouth, but extreme or something. As you said, the point is you seem to say that you were challenging. You were almost bringing more devotion to religion to them than they were necessarily instilling in you. Not that they weren't devoted, but you seem to be at the beginning of your life when you were young, mm-hmm. a teenager. Your thoughts were saying, "Well, I've got to go maybe deeper into this than that." Yeah, them. yeah. I I knew from a young age that I was called to a ministry, so I thought I was going to become a Southern Baptist preacher my whole life. Okay. Um, I remember at like eight or nine years old telling my parents, "I'm going to be a preacher." Okay. Um, and I don't feel like as an actor, I'm that far off from being a preacher because sure. you're both relaying messages in hopes of inspiring and challenging, right? Yes. Um, but yeah, they. I mean, even though they were deeply rooted in the Southern Baptist ideals they still led with love. And so anything that I was, you know, questioning or going through, they they never made me feel bad for questioning or going through it. They just wanted to be, a, you know, to support my my journey through it, I guess. And so your journey at the time, though, was one of, you know, you weren't obviously at that age able to articulate your sexual orientation, and mm-hmm. you weren't able to, um, you were bringing to them a desire to at least love God in a mm-hmm. new way, right? So that wasn't necessarily challenging. They're right. like they're like seeing their son be devoted and trying to figure out how to be devoted in the right, right. way to God. You're not throwing, um, you're you're not trying to uh, raise a finger to God or anything. No, like that. no, 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 you know, no. You're no, being yeah. very reverent. Yes, well, because the deep, the more reverent and the deeper that I could go within my faith meant that I could potentially be cured of homosexuality. How early were you when you... I remember at five years old wow. having having feelings of just wanting... There's a boy in my kindergarten class that I just wanted to be closer with. Wow. Um, and he actually um, has a namesake in my film. Um, I hope he didn't, never sees it. <laughs> um, but one of the characters is, is... I mean, and the name's never mentioned, I don't think. But uh, yeah, I mean, I remember from very early on just f- having a desire... To be closer to, and you're to, like, it's not necessarily, a, it's not exactly the same as how you feel about friends. Correct. It's it was some, something it's some, some different, intimate. Feeling. Yeah, and wow. not sexual because like you're five, yeah, and you're it's creepy. Five, right. um, but you know, but it is something intimate. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So you were able to you and you and you clocked that at that age, and how mm-hmm. how many years after that were you able to start to kind of articulate? I mean, the the, the movie, you're a very young boy. Yes. The, 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 the boy representing you at that age is yeah. very young. Yes. Um, so you must have been able to articulate at a very young age this for year. For sure. For sure. Okay. But it wasn't until I was around probably, I mean, a freshman in college that I started really thinking like, oh, God, is this ever going to go away? Mm. And then maybe tw- I, I came at it to my parents at 20. Um, came out at 20. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and only because my, my poor parents... Had a, uh, I was going to go out to meet a friend for dinner, and my dad said, "Son, I just want you to come, come and sit down for a second. I was like, "Okay." He said, "I just," he would kill me for even saying this story. He would say, "I just, I'm concerned about your sexuality," and I was like, "Oh gosh," um, and it all came out. I mean, and I did too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, wow. I yeah, guess, and they just, you know, they there was a lot of tears, uh, but a lot of love. I mean, they they just were concerned for I think my safety, my happiness, um, my eternity. Mm. Um, you know, it was all. It was a very. Do you have siblings? L- I have a little brother who's okay. my biggest advocate. Yeah, um, cool. He looks like D- Duck Dynasty, and he loves like Jesus Christ. I mean, he is just. He is the best. He's the reason I think me and my parents have the relationship we do today. Wow, he was able to kind of help bridge he some of this the, stuff. He is a, a the bluest of liberals in small town Alabama while wearing camouflage and a big red beard. Wow, what a wonderful person. He is the best. Well, if he ever visits, tell him to come on I the show. I will. Uh, that's, that's, um, well, that's beautiful, first of all. I'm very happy to hear that your relationship with your parents is really yeah, strong. Yeah, they're and, the best. You know, and, and they're very loving. Um, so you... We we have to go to a break here real soon, but um, 
So one thing that we'll get into after the break is at kind of the hook of your film, which is at a very young age, something that you were introduced mm-hmm. to, and a, a concept that was being driven to you, uh, driven into you as um, a young boy, and and you know what? Let's just go to the break now, and yeah. I want to, and because I can't open this up until we get yeah, back. it's so, a can of worms. <laughs> all right, so let's um, you know, we'll see you back here in a couple of minutes. Thanks. Cool, thanks. Right, we're back with Matt Hayes, and um, so Matt, one of the hooks in your film is the child, you, the young boy, is hearing the preacher um, at your church talk about AIDS, mm-hmm. and so please just jump jump off that yeah. high dive <laughs> right now do, and, and, and tell us, you know, kind of what that means to you and what that how that was brought up to you as a yeah, young no boy. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so I I recall a sermon growing up very vividly. Um, that addressed um, the the gays for the first time from um, my pastor, who's a who is a sweet, loving man. Um, I just and he probably has grown since then as well. Um, That's very generous. I, I, I you know well I yeah if we can't believe in the people's ability to grow and change, what do we believe in? Um, so I I trust that he has had his journey. Um, but I remember a sermon about gay days at Disney World, and he was so he was calling on us to boycott Disney because mm. they allowed. Um, gays and lesbians to come in and basically hold hands through the park. How awful is that, you know? Um, and I will never forget that sermon. Um, and and there were, you know, several... And you're how old? Um, maybe... Oh my gosh, maybe eight, nine? Right, and so you were able to say earlier on the show that around five you started to articulate. Mm-hmm. So by, by eight or nine, you, I knew, you, was you, you knew you were different. I kn- and I knew that... My, you might be that. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that being um, a homosexual. Right. And what I had learned about homosexuals through the church at this point was that uh, AIDS, because, you know, this was at the the the, the middle of the AIDS crisis, not the AIDS crisis per se, but because we had already discovered, you know, kind of what caused AIDS, what led to it, um, you know, who had it, uh, what kind of medica- you know, what medicines could do for it. But I, um, it was still... I mean, the political movement, gosh, they just really attached AIDS to to sin and homosexuality. And so I learned through the church that AIDS was basically God's punishment for being gay. Mm. Um, God had sent us AIDS to wipe out the gays, as and um, that was your... And so in my young, formative mind, I knew that I was different, being that I liked boys, and if I liked boys, I was gay, and if I was gay, I had AIDS. Wow. So I, re- I remember people would have, because, you know, as artists, we're always in our heads, right? Um, I remember people asking me as a kid, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I would I would tell them, you know, maybe whatever it was, and but in my mind, I knew that I wasn't going to grow up. I had AIDS. Um, and that's a direct line that's in the film as well. I mean, I'd probably right. just with the same inflection. <laughs> do, but you, do you even remember uh, speculating on what age you thought you'd make it to? Um, I knew that it would not be old. I knew it would be young. Wow. Um, just I because mean, that was so... my punishment. I mean, I was a sinful creature. Right. And uh, and I, I, I could not be saved from this because I liked boys. <sighs> Um, and you know, if, if I had verbalized that, I know that my parents would have said, son, that's not true. Um, and, or somebody would have, you know, uh, I mean, at that point I had not had sexual relations, yeah. so like, sure. but, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you weren't doing any needle drugs. So, no, you know, there wasn't any, that was later on. <laughs> yeah. Also, mom, it was not, I never did needle <laughs> yeah. drugs. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. It, but I, so somebody would have corrected that mindset. But I mean, what eight year old would know to articulate that to somebody? Of course. I mean, and how could you not experience this? How could you not take him at his yeah. at his word? I mean, he's he's presenting it precisely the way that you interpreted it. Yeah. You know, it's not that he meant you. He wanted you, the yep. preacher wanted you to get the information exactly the way you did. You're it wasn't correct. My fault. And that's why my film's title is called Cognitive because it was all about his cognition to receiving information. Um, and that's what's so scary is that you know we through ch- not just churches but any kind of organization um, w- as it relates to kids, one person can completely dictate somebody's POV, completely mm. alter their outlook on the world. And that's as someone who wants to be a parent, and, and you are a parent, that mm-hmm. terrifies me um, to know that someone could change how my kid sees the planet and and, and sees humanity. Mm-hmm. My God. Mm-hmm. Well, I, you know, not to go into it too much about my own side of it, but I absolutely think about these things, and it's one of the reasons why over the last few years my child will be three in the fall, and oh. it's one of the reasons that over the last few years I've, I've done a very, very 
deep dive into articulating my point of view on yeah. religion and that sort of thing. I was, as I say, I was raised Roman Catholic. I was a devout child. In fact, I actually I wanted to be a priest when I grew up as wow. well. So I had a similar uh, response to to that to that calling as a young child. And all I can trust in is that you know if I my goal is to create awareness as best I can at a, yeah. at, an, at an age where the child is both impressionable and you think maybe the child is too young to hear some of these things, but keep them open because you don't know when they're going to hear them from other people. So, well, and better to let them hear those things versus creating their own things to hear. Sure. That's a good point. Yeah. So I, 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 uh, I also though, believe me, I empathize with that thought and yeah. I'm the one I'm, and I, I'm living it now and you will live it at some point. If you want yeah. to be a parent, you will go through this and it's cool that you're thinking about it. It's yeah. good to be thinking about it. It's good to, sure. I believe in articulating these things as best we can. I do too. Um, well, it's really fascinating. It's, it's heavy. You know, it's one of these moments where sometimes I, I, I grew up with a certain amount of um, anger against my structural upbringing. There's a lot of beautiful, beautiful things too. I also have a very loving relationship with my parents. Mm-hmm. My parents' expression of their Faith is very, um, I think, a very beautiful expression of their faith. But it's also uh, when people get to have those kinds of authoritative positions and they get to deliver information that you disagree with and and then you're threatened um, with, you know, sort of fear or, Mm -hmm. you know, punishment um, creates a lot of anger, you know. So it's it's interesting. So how are you doing with your relationship now to Mm -hmm. how do you articulate... Um, your relationship to God now, yep. to your relationship to Jesus now, your relationship to organized religion now. Yep. Um, very interestingly, because I, I still I still have a faith that I is based in Christianity, just because it was my context growing up. It's what I know. It's you know I've traveled a lot. I've seen a lot of other religions and how they're executed or, or applied, rather. It's, uh, and I so I still do adhere to a Christian form of my faith. Um, but what I've really kind of discovered is that. People of other religions have a similar saying about their own faith, and I cannot and will not ever tell someone that their faith is not adequate. Um, that is my biggest qualm with the evangelical sect of Christianity: is them is uh, applying a supremacy to their faith. Mm-hmm. It's not fair, and it's and you cannot offer damnation to someone. Um, if, if just because you want to make your own faith seem more significant and legitimate. Uh, and, and I think that's why I, I really struggle with humanity right now, because I, I truly do believe that God transcends um, physical being, obviously. God transcends gender. Um, God transcends sexuality. I'm, I, you know, we, don't even, we can't even just give an idea as to what God is. But I do believe that every one of us is a bit of, of the divine. Um, we are an expression of the divine. And there's a lot of beauty in that, but there's also a lot of detriment. Um, right now, you know, without getting political, like uh, those people um, who have a lot of hate and fear in their heart are being empowered and encouraged to speak louder. And that's really challenged my view of God, because when I see a lack of humanity, I feel like I'm seeing a lack of deity. And if I am experiencing a lack of deity, I don't see a lot of point in going on. You know what I mean? Going on in what? Um, Going, what do you mean by that? Not like in a suicidal, like, I, I can't live on this earth anymore, but I, I, can't, I cannot wake up every day without having a faith in the divine, um, whether it be God of the Christian faith or the God of, of the Jewish faith or, or whatever faith, um, or just the source of energy, the source of existence. Because um, I, I do think that God encompasses all that. Um, in my morning meditation and prayer, I always am giving gratitude for, um, for the source of my joy and my hope and my mm. faith and my love. And it all, you know, it is, I mean, to me, it is, it is my God. Um, but to others who have that same gratitude, it could be a whole different divine source. Um, and so when I'm seeing that divine source being outweighed by its opposite, which is what we're seeing a lot of right now, it really challenges me. So you, so I think if I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly, I hope you you still, I'm not sure I am. Well, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I appreciate people coming in here. I, you know, you should not be punished for trying to articulate something that is basically inarticulatable. Right, you know, right. it took me a while to load that word. I, <laughs> I knew I was like, this is gonna be a lot of syllables. Um, but if I'm hearing you correctly, I think what you're saying is, is you still have a very a very deep devotion to a positive g- 
god force yeah. in the world. Oh my gosh, yeah. You don't want to. Um, certainly, I sympathize with this. You don't want to judge someone else by having a different relationship no. or, or articulation of what that god force is. Um, you're and not I saying that God those. speaks. Yeah, right, right. But what you're saying though is is that you believe God as a generally positive force. One hundred percent. And so what you're saying though is is you see a kind of rising negative force. Yeah. Does that represent? Do you believe in the devil still as a sort of God opposite? Not the devil, um, you know, as I was taught growing sure. up. Sure. I mean, the, look, we were both yeah, taught what the devil like, is. This is one of the right. why reasons um, I ask this question is how does that still But there does in your seem mind? to be a, a challenging force to what I see as God. Mm. Um, and I don't, and you know, and that could just be the, the, the lack of God, a lack of source, um, which is interesting because a lot of these people who are empowered are basing their thoughts and opinions on a God. Oh, right. Um, right. When in reality, it's a lack of a God that's driving this fear and this anger and this hatred. Right. So, um, but I do think we're going to come out of it. Um, and that's why I'm, I, you know, I make film and why we all, you know, as artists, we, wanna, we want to progress the world in a direction that is encompassing for everyone. Uh, so I, I do have faith that we're going to come out of it on the other end, okay? Yeah. We just have to continue to do our jobs. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you it's know, I, I, I think it's really beautiful sta- beautifully stated. I really appreciate you sharing. I mean, I, I um, you know, I hold a slightly... I, I don't, my, it's not my job to instill optimism here. You know, yeah. it's, it's, your, I just, it's our job to sit and just hear the yeah. guest of the day speak in a really eloquent way about how they are tackling everything. You know, I, look, I tend, as I've mentioned on on this show before, I tend to think about things in an evolutionary standpoint. Mm-hmm. I, I don't really think of things in kind of God format in that yeah. particular way anymore, like God influence. And um, I tend to see, despite the fact that there is a lot of stuff I disagree with in the world and yeah. I find it really, really disconcerting and, 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 and very bad from my point of view, I also, thankful, I by looking at things in evolutionary standpoints, I tend to get a lot of relief because yeah. humans have made a lot of mistakes for a long, long time, yeah. and we just have it in us to make these mistakes. And so there are these cycles. And so that's where I, I attach some hope, you of know? Of course. Um, and I think you're speaking to that too. But, you know, it's, it's fascinating to think about how we relate. How does, you know, you're talking, I think, and like I said, I appreciate you doing so, talking about... Um, a relation to a living God force in your life, and what does it mean if a God force can can have can Im- seem to empower such individuals that seem to have such an opposition to you? Yeah. And then you are speaking very particularly about a very specific issue, which is the LGBTQ, yeah. you know, movement is something you're expressing, and 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 how they've used God to to kind of hurt Squash you them. in your yeah. life. Yeah. Well, and I'm, there's and there's. Or there are churches and congregations within the evangelical movement and within the the larger Christian faith that that affirm and include them. I, I mean, I, I don't want to go without saying that those exist. That's fair. No, I'm I'm um, glad you did. I'm glad yeah. you did. No, that's important to remember. Absolutely. My gosh, yeah. Yeah, but it's but I imagine they are having a very difficult time yeah. uh, trying well, to Methodists articulate Methodists right now alone. Like you know, they just came out with their general council, basically saying that gays cannot be clergy, and mm. um, and we don't necessarily inc- uh, see them as as legitimate married couples in the eyes of God. And they just did. That's yeah, just like, like a, like a, a this year. Ago. Oh my god! Yeah, oh my and goodness. and the church I go to in Talk Hollywood, about doubling Hollywood, down. Oh my gosh! Yes, but but because of that, it's causing others to double down even harder. Which um, like the Hollywood Union of Methodist Church, which is one of the first churches in the area to welcome um, the gay community back in the eighties, uh, they have doubled down and and you know are are looking at other options that are not maybe in being included in that denomination mm. uh, because they cannot be associated with a congregation that does not accept and include everyone uh, because they see God the same way. Do you find that you, um, as you, as you are growing, I, again, I don't know how old you are, but you, as you're, we won't talk about it. <laughs> okay. Well, I believe me, I'm older than you, but it's fine. Uh, do you find that you spoke that you were at the beginning. You were called to ministry. Clearly, this is a passionate subject for you. Mm-hmm. Do you find that um, you are beginning to see that your your road is tied? You'd like. Would you like your mission to be tied to Christianity, in the sense that you want to support congregations that support your? You know, sexuality and, and I mean, and, and, sure, and the, in this community at large, but not or is that sh- not the not that's not a primary focus? It's are you more attached to sort of the the advancement of the LGBTQ community more so than if it is tied to Christianity, or would you? 
Could you live without a Christianity tied to LGBT? One hundred percent. You could. One hundred percent. Okay. Cool. Um, because because Christianity is is what I have been brought up in. So like that that experience of faith is still where I draw a lot of my inspiration. But I would never want to make someone feel like that's how they are going to get inspired. Right. Um, right. My my goal and what I've seen through my film is that you know even though I wanted to be a minister growing up, as a as an as an a filmmaker, an actor, and you know, activist. I still am. It may not be at a pulpit with a cross behind me, but my goal is still to help people feel more attached to the divine, to a God. Um, and I've seen through the response to this film, especially, um, especially with a lot of middle-aged gay men who are still suffering trauma from the church that they've mm. never dealt with, um, they still want to find that hope. Mm. Uh, and so, it, if it's through a church that maybe off opens their doors and says, we we think you get to go to heaven, which is the opposite of what they heard growing up. Um, you know, I, that's great if it's if it's through something else. You know, there's a lot of incredible synagogues around here that are flying a rainbow flag right now. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the, you know, the Unitarian Universalist Church. Yeah, um, I've, we, we've gone to the one up in um, Pasadena. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's the one there. I think there's one yeah. downtown, too. Yeah, um, yeah. And, 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 we, and we, it's very inclusive, to, very lovely. I don't believe people have to be attached to a congregation to experience that. You know, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's a very internal thing as well. I, I, it's, it's what is helping me find, um, you know, f- uh, a purpose and, and, and light in the world, but I, I don't feel like that's what works for everyone. Right, right. Well, I, I uh, no, that's interesting, yeah. and thanks for sharing. So, um, okay, I want to get back to, uh, we got into some really, really great stuff, but I also just want to ask some basic questions about um, your your parents, I don't feel like I need to dig too much, to be honest with you. It sounds like you didn't experience a lot of your resistance as you were through your growth was not with your parents in particular. Yeah, I know. Um, so you, you know, you, they were, they raised you Southern Baptist. Mm-hmm. You, were they born in the same town you were born in or were they no, born in Alabama? they relocated to Decatur from Gadsden, um, which is a, another little river is town. Is in Alabama? It is in Alabama, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, it's about... An, I'm from Nebraska. I, I, <laughs> which is kind of the same thing, just like put perpendicular, right? Sure, yeah, I mean, that's just, exactly right. It's just right. laid out differently, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, uh, there's A's in it. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> oh, there's a B. Yeah. Um, so, um, okay, okay. So, so they were... So they're from Alabama. Mm-hmm. Uh, they ra- they raised you there. Yeah. What do your parents do for a living? Uh, my dad is an electrician, and my mom is a registered nurse. So they, yeah, they're hardworking, you know, normal jobbers is what I call them. Okay. Um, so raising me, you know, wanting to, you know, be an, an actor and like wanting to do, to do choir and everything. I think I just I cannot imagine being them and having to raise me. I mean, my lord. Right. You you. So and did they you... never squashed anything. They were so encouraging. They were always so like. We, we're going to figure out how to do, do it. Uh, do you see any other people that you were raised with, like other peers that had parents that were not as welcoming? Did you 100%. watch them go through 100%. pain that maybe you didn't have to go through? Yep. You already had to go through enough pain. Well, and you didn't have to see them almost be abused maybe or yeah. be be dismissed at the very least. Yep. And even thanks to social media, you know, we, we can stay in touch with a lot of our childhood friends. Um, and I have some that are my age, if not older, who will reach out to me and just looking for hope because they're they're still either not able to be honest with their parents or they have been and their parents even as adults have have told them we're done with you wow. we're disconnected it's such a brutal i mean i can't it's imagine it's not my bring, job to sit here and just say this is very very sad but right. it's very sad oh it's more than that i can't <laughs> imagine bringing something into this world alive and then if it doesn't turn out how i want it right to say I'm then my love is not enough here. So yeah, it's it's um, it is the thing that I love exploring is how people balance the desire to to articulate their core beliefs and and instill them in their children or mm-hmm. influence those around them, and yet at the same time live with the fact that there will never be any full cohesion on ideas right um that a child will have will have their own ideas in opposition a child whether they don't even whether they even want to agree with you will resist simply by the act of being your child they will yeah. want to rebel and and uh, <laughs> it makes me so sad uh when i hear what you just expressed that 
Um, but I am happy as we go to our break that that you did not have par- that you had parents that were welcoming. yes. Um, okay, we're gonna take our our our, our second break, our final break, uh, and we'll be back for one more segment with Matt Hayes. Yay. All right, everyone, we're back with Matt Hayes. Um, so, Matt, I wanted to ask you, did you have a... You seem, you're giving me an impression that, that despite growing through some trauma, that you were just kind of a good boy. Uh, did you have a counter-reaction? Like, did you... You know, I don't hear you talking about, like, there's no references to, that's when I used to booze all day. Right. And there's, I still you know, do booze all day. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, I, but you seem to have... You know, you referenced this in the last segment that you you know people that you grew up with who did not get out of this. Yeah. Almost directly tied to the fact that your parents were accepting of you. Despite, I'm sure, having difficulties. You talked about being yeah. crying and things. I'm not yeah, saying yeah, it yeah. was perfect. but And if you want to speak more on that, I'd love for you to. But maybe that's as complicated as it is. You yeah. know, it's they, there was some crying. It was difficult. But they loved you and showed you love yes. and allowed you to express yourself. Yes. So here you are able to articulate how the world around you didn't like you, but at least your family loved mm-hmm. you, and so now you can, with love, bring this this message out into the world. Mm-hmm. Obviously, lots of other people around you didn't get that same right. love in their own home. Yeah. Because of that, it sounds like you didn't have to go into some maybe big counter-reaction, a big, like, let's blow everything right. up, let's right. go deep into some other drugs or, or alcohol right. or sex or whatever. Yeah. Not that you haven't had this stuff, right. but it's, it's to say that you didn't have, like, an an aggressive counter reaction. Is that right? You know, I, I've never thought about it really, but I guess I didn't. I mean, I feel like, you know, of course I've made poor, poor choices. Um, sure. and continue coming to on this show Poor, poor choice. Yeah, no, please. <laughs> this is one of the best ones. Um, yeah. So I, I guess that's, that's accurate and that I never went through a spell of, I mean, you know, I may have gone, I've gone through spells of depression or anxiety, but that probably is the extent of, I mean, I've, yeah, there's never been like a period of just, Oh God, we're really worried about where he's going. You mm. know what I mean? Yeah, um, no, I mean I, I don't think. that's the My impression I'm getting. Like, you oh, seem to be. Actually was. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to be. You know that you're not living with any deep. I mean, again, I experience depression and anxiety too, sure. and, and and almost everyone that's come on this show has expressed that because what we're talking about when we get into this world is we're talking about our own psychological mm-hmm. relationship to the outside God or mm-hmm. mystery or universe or whatever you want to call it, and so those things are. Often, if we're in a depressive state, we're reaching out in that way. Yeah. So I get all of that, but it's positive. Certainly, you seem to be a, explaining. A, you seem to be representing a very positive um, example that the narrative of growing up gay in the South and Southern Baptist, although very painful can just sort of be salvaged by, like, a loving family and yeah. a parents that care. And... I think that's putting it pretty simply, yeah. But, I, you know, I think for me, I all, even from a young age, I always saw going through... You, we go through trauma so that others don't have to. And if mm. you are, you're honest and vocal about that, that's what negates somebody else suffering the negative side effects, I think. So I've always tried to, like, be... You know, whether it's mental health or whether it's my my faith or my, you know, struggle with being gay or whether it's my struggle in the industry as an, you know, not working actor. Like, I want to talk about it so that others can feel like, okay, thank God there's somebody who understands me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, That's lovely. And, I, and that, I think, also helps to heal ourselves. Um, you know, part of the reason that I made this film was not just to heal others who've gone through it and others who you know, like myself, but to help the kid that's still in the pew who's hearing this message in 2019 on a Sunday, mm-hmm. you know? Um, that's truly how we heal, I think, is by helping others heal. Yeah, that's what's... Well, it's really beautiful. It's clear you have a... It's clear that you're mission-oriented with this, that yes. you have a drive because you can articulate it well. You 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 recognize that you're you're able to thread this interesting needle where you are these things, you've experienced these things, and yet you don't live with... Such an overbearing trauma that you're un- that you that you're unable to talk about it. Right. You're quite willing to talk about it. You have a desire to talk mm-hmm. about it, mm-hmm. and that's really probably uh, too much. But I yeah. know. <laughs> hey, look on this show. I need to fill an hour. No, um, I love hearing about it, and uh, it's fascinating to me to get to hear the story. And I hope yeah. the listeners feel that way too. I'm sure they will. I do too. Yeah. Um, so, do you 
one of the questions I tend to get to, and I love getting to it uh, because oh, it's yay. just so impossibly uh, complicated. But do you believe then in a in a in a heaven? Do you still believe in heaven, uh, or do you believe in a heaven and hell? Maybe not. Uh, do you have an afterlife? orientation anymore still? I mean, where, how much does the Christian upbringing and framework that you were raised with still influence your, your, your thinking on that? You know, I've said that I still have a a Christian viewpoint of all that stuff, but this is where I might contradict myself because I, I don't necessarily believe, of course, in the heaven and hell that we're taught growing up, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, the, the pearly gates and then the, the flaming sea. Mm. Um, but, you know, if my belief is that God is displayed everywhere, then the only experience I'm having with God is in the present. And so I I can't imagine, I mean, I cannot live my life with an expectation of the afterlife. Because mm. it may just be that when I die, I die. And that, that may be what heaven is. It may be the lack of stress and the lack of anxiety and the lack of negative influence. It may just be peace, mm. you know? Um, I don't know. And so... So that may be where I contradict myself in saying that I still see things from a Christian viewpoint, because that's not a Christian viewpoint. Right, right. Um, well, but I, I, just to kind of give you my response to what I think you're saying, is I will often say that I'm... So, you know, you know Jessalyn, obviously. Mm-hmm. She speaks very strongly about being culturally Jewish. Right. Uh, and this is a very common thing among my friends that are Jewish, whether you're de- devout or, or yes. very liberal. Um uh, the identity of being Jewish is very strong. I, I, I think on lesser levels, we also are culturally Christian or culturally Southern yeah. Baptist or culturally Catholic, as I would speak about it. Because again, all of my all of my traditions come from this. The uh-huh. way that I think about any family tradition. So when I think about when I hear you, I want you to know, and you can tell me differently. But when I hear you talk about like my framework, I still think of things from a Christian perspective. You and I may be different on how much you pray and uh, resonate with God directly in your life, but I still, I hear you as you saying mostly that how can you not be Christian to some extent because culturally the world, the prism with which you met the world for the mm-hmm. first 20 years of your life is Christian framed, yeah. right? Is that yeah. sort of what you speak about? Or yeah. would you, or, or, or are there any tenets, maybe this is the better question, are there tenets of Christianity that you still believe in very strongly, I am Christian in these ways? Right. Yes. So that's, that's I, you know, the question when, I think I needed to get to. It took me a long time of talking to myself. No, to it, get it helped to clarify it to me as well. <laughs> my gosh. But I, you know, I think so. A lot of my friends are also culturally Jewish, and that they they know that's their heritage and their their lineage. Um, I think, and there's nothing wrong with that. What? Yeah, no. But of I do think that being culturally Christian is a detriment because what is cultural Christianity that we know of, and it's the anti-LGBTQ, it's the xenophobia, it's the transphobia, it's the you know the the letting people die at the border. Uh, yeah. It's those that's cultural Christianity to me. Um, but I think being practically Christian would be thinking about where does Christianity come from, and it's it's the Christ. And what we know of the Christ is to be the one that welcomes people and loves people and heals people and helps to inspire people. That I think being practically Christian is what would maybe fix the cultural Christianity. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. Well, I, I was introduced to uh, the historical Jesus mm-hmm. uh, in college. That was something that I really attached myself to at that time. It helped me take my take Jesus of the different Gospels as they spoke about his kind of, the kind of magical realism of Jesus mm-hmm. at those times, um, which is obviously still a very important part of most Christian faith today if you if you practice whether you're catholic or whether you're southern baptist right. you know the 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 magical sense of jesus as the son of god who you know died on the cross for our sins and resurrected and could perform miracles mm-hmm. that stuff started to was one of the earlier things that started to die away from me not right. making much sense and so then I was able to articulate the historical Jesus more and sort of be like, ah, oh, here's a rebel. 100%. Here's, here's, a, here's a revolutionary. Here's someone that was questioning the political structure, and yes. the, religious, the po- religio-political structure of the time. Yeah. And That's exactly where I am as that's well. That's where you are. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Because cool. I don't, I mean, if I think too hard about the, 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 the spiritual Jesus uh, with the miracles and the resurrection, like, that's too much for me to, to really comprehend. And, and you know, not to say that I can't have faith in that, but... Um, Certainly, people would say it's your faith. Right. It's your lack of faith right. that makes you not comprehend right. it. Right. But, but I am with you in understanding that you know I didn't. I was able to sort of take that away and mm-hmm. and but and, and bury that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, please. I mean, this is uh, that helped me understand myself, I guess. <laughs> but you know, I, it's 
I have been listening to myself also and thinking, I hope people don't think that I'm trying to preach Jesus to people because in essence, the only people that I want to preach Jesus to is the people that claim to follow him. Mm. Um, I think they're the ones who are, who are causing trauma in people like me and, and these, you know, these young kids who are just being told that they're not good enough. I just think it's, that's really lovely. Kind of gave me chills actually hearing that. And it just speaks to the sadness, you know, that know. you are, that you and people that are experiencing your um, ostracization. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Being a lot ostracized. of big Scrabble words you're I really, out today. I find you, you see, it's like my brain's like, I never going to play used, Scrabble. I should have gotten you. a third <laughs> cup of coffee before I got into these words. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, ostracization can't be used. It's way too many letters. <laughs> right. um, it's, there's a sadness, mm-hmm. right? And um, and it's not that that's like new, right? But for me to hear, you know. But it's it's uh, one of the things that I appreciate about this show is that the people I've had on, they know what they're getting into, so they know what they're talking about. And people like you who are very eloquent and very thoughtful about this are expressing, you know, what it's like that you're like, look, my life is good. Everything is fine. I'm figuring it out, Mm -hmm. but it's sad. You know, there are some sadnesses here. I feel like people are against me in certain ways and I don't live with that in that same way. Right. I'm a straight white male who, um, look, I have, I have my own, everyone has their own crap in the world, but you know, speaking, I, I had the same feeling with Jessalyn and my friend, Jeff Astroff, who are both Jewish and talking very specifically about, how um, the prejudice they experienced growing up. And it's it's just, it's, I think, healing as I hope it's healing for people. Yeah. And, and to get back to what you were speaking about, I, I feel like, I hope that anyone that listens to this show, first of all, it's so easy to turn this show off. I imagine that if they don't want to hear people talking or if they think they're being preached to, then they won't listen. But I, my guess is that people are listening to you going, um, the nature of this show is I give people a platform to speak how they feel about something. Right. It's not preaching. It's just they're just speaking yeah, openly about how exactly. they feel. So you don't have to feel, I don't think you have to feel worried about that. But Good. I can imagine, you know, that that it is difficult to walk that line, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you want, how do we get out there and like pound the table mm-hmm. without telling people that they're wrong too? You know, yeah. it's hard, hard to walk that, hard to threat. You have to call people wrong. Yeah. And yet at the same time, you have to love them and hope that, show them encouragement yep. and I will never them. tell someone they're wrong unless they're demeaning somebody else. That's yes. the, that's, that's my litmus test. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. That's a good litmus test, which we're seeing a lot of right now, but that's yes. going to, we're, we're a part of the change. Thankfully. Yeah. Yeah. Well, six, we minutes, spoke about six God a lot, left. but we've not spoken about the delicacies and, and by delicacies, I mean the delicately thin sliced layers of roast beef at Arby's. Did you, the um, plug <laughs> that you just, I know. you laid it I hope out I'm compensated so for that. <laughs> beautifully. All right. M- many people who know me know that because it tends to get brought up in most interviews I do whenever I'm doing a show or something. And uh, my father owns Arby's. He's an Arby's franchisee in Omaha, Nebraska. My brothers work for him as well. My whole family has been oriented towards Arby's. It's my dream job. <laughs> and and Matt, so as I was getting to know Matt, I naturally went to visit his social media pages just to be like, okay, what does this dude like? Uh, and and in his profile, it says, <laughs> I can't remember the exact quote, but it's... it's. I love Arby's more than life. I love Arby's more than life. Yeah. And so instantly I was like, Matt, by the way, we have an instant connection <laughs> Uh, I, my dad's an Arby's franchisee. Uh, so, um, yeah, man, look, I was working at Arby's from when I was 14 to, you know, through college. Uh, oh you know, gosh. I used to have a ponytail at one time in college. I used to tuck it up into the hat. Oh my God. Which is maybe too much information. Nope. Uh, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, man, uh, you know, both my parents, both my brothers are, you know, working for Arby's. My nieces, my niece is working at Arby's now. So you were saying on the, when we were talking about this, that you, when you first came out to LA, almost like as a way of feeling connected to home, you know, as you're the transplant, you were going to Arby's once a week? Every Sunday. <sighs> yeah. Um, and they That knew- was, so that, so you were going to church and then going to your Arby's church. I wasn't really going to church See, then. there you go. Arby's was the bridge before you found I the know. church you wanted to find. I know, exactly. Do you still go every week to church, by the way? Uh, not every week, but a lot of weeks, yeah. Okay. Cool. I, I'm very involved with the, the homeless ministry at my church, like, <sighs> doing stuff. So, That's lovely. Yeah. All right, not to derail from Arby's yeah. again, but yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you, do, how often do you go to Arby's now? Uh, well, I've um, since I've started my uh, my mental health journey, I've, I've, I take a Lexapro regimen, uh, which I am 
very passionate about people exploring their mental health. Um, and that has caused me to gain some weight. And so I don't go as much anymore well, to Arby's. Well, that makes sense. Um, but I still go at least twice a month. I used to go every single Sunday for years. Okay, what's the order? What do you love? You said that yep. they know your they, order. They know my order, yeah. So I do just... Or they a, used to, at least. Right. So it starts with just roast beef sandwich. Just and the, they, the, the regular. Now right, they yep. call it the... Oh, it's still the regular. It but is. they've changed the names of the, all the other they ones. They also changed the order of the menu. So it used to be like the number one, and then number three, now it's number six. Um, that is but so annoying. I know. It is, I know. <laughs> I know. Um, but they, and then they dice up jalapenos and they roast them on the grill, throw those on there. Hold on a second. Yeah. When did they start getting jalapenos at Arby's? Um, when they added the sliders. The jalapeno poppers. No, the, no, slider, the sliders. They have a slider menu. And that came out a couple years, th- about maybe three or four years ago. <gasps> okay. That's yeah. interesting. Uh-huh. And I love, then Swiss I love cheese. The okay. So you make a regular and then you make it special to you. Yes. Or okay, they sorry. make it special for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Of course. You asked them to do it. <laughs> yeah. So you get you, you slice up and roast up jalapenos in the grill. Yep. And then Swiss cheese. Yep. Okay. And Anything then else? I add Arby's and horsey sauce. You get both sauces? Yes. How many packets of each? One I do each? one each because it gets really slimy. Yeah, for sure. How many regulars? One? I do one, but like the, the medium size. Uh, uh-huh. So you almost, what used to be called the giant. Right. So and you now do, there's, there's a larger bun. Yes. Uh-huh. They have, there's three sizes. Uh-huh. Um, so I do the, the regular is like the medium size. And uh-huh. then I also, but of course, curly fries and a cup of cheddar. Um, and then I always add a pizza slider. And this is what people don't pizza know. Pizza slider? Their pizza slider is one of the most ridiculously good tasting things you can eat on the planet. Is it a roast beef base? No. No. What's it, the... It's like salami and pizza sauce and oh, mozzarella they... on a really little <sighs> white bun. The, the, Arby's, I hope you're listening. I do too. And I just, I mean, their customer service is impeccable. Ah, they must, my dad will be so happy to hear no, this. No, the manager, the one on Sunset, is the nicest guy. So, like, engaged with his customers. He's been there for years. Um, I'm obsessed with them. I thank <laughs> I you so too. much for this. You You've really, got a new sponsor gosh, for your show, you really I think, hit me you know? right in the heart. <laughs> um, Matt, I just can't think of a better way to go out. That was beautiful. <laughs> um, I, uh, Look, the the whole interview was was so lovely, so articulate. You clearly have such developed ideas on this, and mm-hmm. I really appreciate you coming in and sharing. Thank you for having me. And I hope that everybody enjoyed it uh, as much as I did. And please go watch his movie, Cognitive. And, and if any of I mean, if any of your listeners are LGBTQ and maybe struggling to come out or dealing with their faith and and need someone to bounce their words off of. Nobody can hesitate to speak to me. Um, I'm easy to find on social media, uh, matthays.com and at, at Hayes on it on all the major social media platforms. Thanks. Yeah, that's awesome, Matt. So we okay. love God, love people, love Arby's. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's put that on the. I'm going to make a flag with that. Matt, thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Okay. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>